At what point do we get to our own internal thinking that we say, hey, you know what? It's not right. And how do I convey that? How do I get across like, yeah, this kind of isn't for me. And, I, and I've been around guys that are masters, masters at handling conflict and, and handling uh, situations to, that would, to most of us, be a little hair-raising or, or we let our emotions get the best of us. I think the older I'm getting is I want to respond better with meaning and purpose instead of just out of emotion. And I don't think you can do that until you realize there's some areas where my emotions do run me. And there are, there are some areas in my life. This isn't something I've mastered. But how do, how do we get to the place we say, no, it's not all right. And, and maybe not, not, not about a situation, just maybe in general. Like, no, things aren't all right right now. Um, that's a slippery slope. You know, it really is. Because at, when do we draw the line at, I'm a complainer. You know, because there is a healthy, if there's something wrong all the time, well, we found where the problem lies, you know, so how do we not become a, I almost said Karen, a, a Ken, like how do, how do we agree differently? I think for me, I try to focus on the input side and let the output, there's so many variables that, that are outside of our control that gives us our results and our output. I try to focus and what I try to help others do is do what you can. So in this specific scenario, even if we are acknowledging our feelings, they're bad, they're terrible, they're, you know, whatever, whatever emotions we're going through, we can't let our emotions control us as you're saying. But so what does that mean? How do emotions control us? Well, it affects our behavior. So, acknowledge embrace the feelings that you're having but again what i tell people is like recognize that emotions change and that's honestly bro the past couple years has been truly like it's been great in my own development so i'm i'm speaking from experience or i'm preaching from experience when i talk to young guys about this like i know that i'm an emotional dude and i have highs and lows so what I have to do is like even out. Don't get too high on your good days. Don't get too low on your bad days. And just understand, recognize that, bro, I'm going to change how I feel after I have a sandwich. <laughs> you, <Right>. know? <laughs> you know, like yeah. I can, I can switch so fast outside of my control. And, but so I don't want to make life altering like huge consequential decisions just because I'm in my feels right now when I know that because I am so emotional, it can be the exact opposite literally five minutes later. Maybe not always five minutes. Maybe it'll be a day or two. But at some point, I'm going to be out of this current emotional state. So I just focus on the behavior that I know whether I'm down, whether I'm up, whether I'm <laughs> side to side, whatever. What are the behaviors that I know are going to get me to my result and just plod forward that's what life is you know it's my theory that i'm developing of life my philosophy of life is just a constant trudge or like just going forward through the thick and the thin you know like playing oregon trail you, <laughs> sometimes you encounter uh rain sometimes you have dysentery good, good weather but the whole object is just keep moving forward yeah and so we can't what what I, what I tell people or like young guys when I have the opportunity to speak to young, young men is I try to help them ma not make the mistakes that I've made. And the mistakes that I've made is making behavioral decisions based on my emotions. Just do what you know to do. It, I think there's two different people. I'll use this analogy. I am a rules stickler. If we're playing game night and we have people come over and we have defined rules and let's say you can't make any sound and it's it's like pictionary or something and you make a sound you're out 
because that was an established rule. And then there's some people like, oh, come on, because you get caught in their emotion. Like, they couldn't help it. Well, it doesn't matter if they can't help it. Like, I am that guy. I will die on this hill. Like, no, do not mark that point down. I will burn this place. Like, I'm like. How are we friends, dude? We are exact opposites. I feel like this entire podcast episode has been about how different we are. I'm the guy that's like, ah, come on. It's, it's, a, it's follow the spirit of the law. Not if, not if we. <laughs> Not if we established, like, this is what we won't do. Now, I'm, I'm getting a little better in my old age, but, like, playing games with my daughter, I've never let my daughter beat me at anything. Anything she's beat me at, she's really beat me. You know, I don't gloat, like, you know, swat her out in the street and be like, ha-ha. No, but I make her earn it. D up, fucker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, that is, like, one thing about me. And, like, sometimes people are like, Really? You, you seem like you don't care about anything, but you care about the rules of Pictionary. And it's like, it's integrity, bro. If we start sliding on that, pretty soon there's money missing off the dresser and <laughs> cars stolen. You know, kids are out robbing people. So you are trying to unlock my Alex Jones side tonight. <laughs> uh, the problem with that, that's the way we were raised. I get it. Like, rules have to be followed. You don't, or they don't have to be. But rules are there, and if they're not followed, it's your choice whether to follow them or not. But if you don't, then there's consequences. Rules are normally important when they're important to us. Yeah. Yeah. I was going a different direction with that. I was going, like, big picture, like, global conspiracy, all this kind of stuff. Like, society. <laughs> the frogs. <laughs> they're putting uh, it in the water. <laughs> uh, that is like, awesome. so, so, we're in a weird place right now. Where all the advice that we grew up learning, the life lessons, the morality, and the same lessons that you're rightly passing on to your daughter, is that really being lived out? Because we see some people literally burning down buildings and they have they they get processed and released right back onto the street. We we see all kinds of crime, violent crime, rapes, murders, uh, all this ins- insane violence, and it's just not punished. Yet, for some people, if you mess up on your taxes, you're going to jail for life. Yeah. It, rules That's... are selectively, like, so, like, we're in a weird place. You're, I mean, you got to teach the consequences of decisions. You've got to teach that rules are to be followed. But kids are looking around. This generation is looking around. It's like, why am, I, why am I following these rules when Daniel, uh, what's his name? Daniel Penny. Do you, do you know that name? You probably know the story. Uh, that that case really gets me right now. Because do you remember a few months back, there was a subway attacker, a crazy dude, threatening people on the subway. And didn't he choke and him out? Daniel or? Penny, I think he's a former Marine or something. And yes, he subdued him. And I don't know, I guess the guy died. And now he's the one being charged. They turned it into a race thing, even though there were there were other races present to help him subdue that guy, but he took the fall. And it's like, what message does that send societally that if you stand up and defend somebody else, if you stand up and do the right thing, that we're taught as men, we're taught to be like defenders, protectors, providers, be be uh, to have honor and character and integrity, all these things. But if that's now being punished and the ones who literally rape and, and beat people, they get to go scot-free. There's something very, very wrong with that. It, it would make you say that the eyes of justice aren't blind and they're selective. <laughs> right. And that is, the, that is the part right there. Selectivism, meaning I pick and choose what's good for me. And that carries over to a lot of areas. I do what's good for me and who cares about anybody else. And that's where people have gotten, uh, you know, I've heard you say before, people have changed so much. I mean, the light can literally turn green and somebody can be honking the horn. It's like, it just turned green. Like people are so encapsulated in, in the go, 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 go. And I believe in being driven. I believe in, 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 in being passionate about what you're doing, but there still is a human factor other than yourself. There's other people. Mm-hmm. I don't live my life for other people, but I also don't live against other people, if that makes sense. 
And I, I shared with Robert about that saying, it's me and you against the world, kid. To, to be raised in a position where it's always you against everybody. And that's just not so. Most people would have great conversations with people if they gave them the time. Most people could sit down who are level-headed, normal human beings, and if they hear each other out, they would say, well, we don't agree on everything. We disagree, you know, and we agree differently, but that's okay. Now I'm learning about you and why, why you have that thought. That's easier said than done because we let our emotions run everything. And if we're not careful, we allow the narrative to, in, to entrap people to not be able to do that. There has to be outrage. There has to be backlash. There has to be destroying somebody instead of saying, okay, hey, it may not change the outcome, but let, let, let's hear it out. And if we could get that way, what does the Bible tell us? Let's take it to the biblical principle. If you have an aunt with a brother, go to him. And if that doesn't work, what are you supposed to do? Take somebody with you. Mm-hmm. Say, hey, look, we need to make this right. But our problem in human nature is I'm right, not we need to make this right. Mm-hmm. Because you and I are to the age, we both know, if there's a disagreement, if there's an argument, argument between people, there's going to be grievances on both sides, whether we want to admit it or not. People, I've sat back people, well, I didn't do anything. Well, I, I'm sure if you could really get the microscope and realize, yeah, I may have, I, I probably had something to do with that. And once you realize, you will reap what you sow. I'm going through the reapest process of things that I, decisions I made out of brokenness and foolishness, but it still doesn't change the fact that I did them. So I still have to go through it. I still have to go through that process. You don't, you don't get away, you know, and some people call it karma. You know, they're not going to give God the credit, and it's just karma. If, if, if you're saying it's karma, well, listen, you're not going to escape karma. Mm-hmm. Me, you're not going to escape God. Right. And even if you, you, sow, you reap. Yeah, and even if you make things right, you're still going to have to go through a process. That's the only way we learn, right. truly learn. Right. Yeah, I mean, yes, people, people, God can save anybody. And he can forgive anybody, but we we still have to do the time if we did the crime. Yeah, you know, just because you got saved in a jailhouse, either literally or metaphorically, it doesn't mean that just because God saves you and you now have a part in the kingdom to come, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you're absolved from your your obligations in this world. I immediately went to Oh Brother Where Art Thou when he said, My sins are absolved. And he said, Well, that's good. The good Lord touched you, but it has nothing to do with the state's charges against you. And that's what you're saying. Soggy bottom, boys. Soggy bottom. That's right. Yeah. But it doesn't change that, does it? Right. God, God's forgiven you. You know, I think you're talking about like the way that we are now. We don't want to get to what is right. We just want to be right. Yeah. And to me, it, it you know, this whole this whole thing about facts over feelings, right? You know, the Shapiro quote: "Facts don't care about your feelings." Right. Like, to me, that's where everything comes down to right now. Politically, uh, relationally, marriages, everybody wants to be right, and they want to feel. They want to constantly emote. We live in a in a society that is constantly emoting. And everything is about how I feel. Do you, I don't know, maybe the algorithms are different on my video feed, but I see video after video, like scroll through and like, there's so much anger in the world today. Like maybe, maybe it's always existed and now it's just a, it's got a voice. Now we just have a cell phone everywhere or a camera ready to capture these. Maybe it's been that way, but I don't think so. I don't think it has. I don't think you see meltdowns at Wendy's and Walmart and, like like you no. do now, just like commonplaces every day. But our society is based not on truth, is the whole point I'm trying to get to. It's not about what is objectively true, what is objectively false. Generations ago, especially, you know, go way back to our founding, everybody, we were in the age of enlightenment where everybody collectively, as the Western uh, civilization progressed, what is truth? What is objectively true? We were, they, we were founded by Enlightenment-era thinkers. But now we've progressed 
way pa- actually past postmodernism where there is no objective truth, where everything is relative. That's why I get so triggered personally. Kristen just laughs at me because she knows it's coming. She knows an Alex Jones rant is about to come. <laughs> I'm going to yell at my TV like a like a boomer. You know, I start throwing things literally or metaphorically when I hear somebody say the phrase, my truth. Well, my truth is, no, there's your perception. There's yeah. your understanding. There's your opinion. But we don't, we're not entitled to our own separate truth. There is the truth. Now, maybe we misunderstand it. And I, I get what you're saying there, like my truth. But truth is capital T. Truth is one. But we don't, we don't focus on what is objectively true. We can't even talk about crime stats uh, politically because it's inconvenient and it makes people feel bad. It produces bad emotions, so we can't talk about objective realities when it comes to economics, to crime, to to uh, uh, immigration, and that's just in a that's just in a political or a governmental context. But then you start getting into on the personal level on into marriages. Why do marriages fail? Because they don't want to see that I have culpability, you have culpability. We have feelings about it, but we can't let our feelings rule over the fact of the situation. Yeah. Everything to me, you know, there's so much that can come down to, you know, <laughs> fact over the, the, the dichotomy about we can't control our emotions long enough to see the truth of the matter. And then of course we got to take the right behavior, the right steps, but uh, we're, we're so, we're so emotional now that, it, it affects everything. It affects our church world. We just want to feel sensual worship. Ooh, God really moved today. How do you know? Well, because I cried during worship. That that third song, I really felt God. Well, I cried to He Stopped Loving Her Today. Does that mean God's in it? Me you know? too, bro. Me too. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. We can't judge, but but we've tra- we've been trained at this point. Everything we judge is based on how we feel about it. Yeah. And facts do not care about your feelings. Yeah. No, that's Sean. That's spot on. I mean, that's sorry for the rant. That's not a rant at all. And I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're speaking like this. You know, that's like doing this little, you know, this, and I'll call it little, this podcast. We don't, I don't have all the answers. That's why I want a multitude of people on here from different walks of life to give their perspective, to realize we may not have all the same answers, but we're fighting in dealing with the same things emotions, uh, reality, um, uh, rent being due. I mean, there, I mean that's just a, a, a tip of the iceberg, but we are all battling and dealing. And it seems to me the older age group that I talk and deal with, even those that grew up staunch, God's not real, God doesn't exist, they are getting to a place where they're like, you know, there's, there's something more. Mm-hmm. There's something more than just me here. Mm-hmm. And... I think denying denying who you really are just creates a ticking time bomb for later. Everybody's emotional. Like, you know, sometimes you can talk about, well, man, they never show emotion. Maybe you've just never talked about anything that they're emotional about. But all of us have a point Absolutely. where we're finally like, A, either enough's enough, or B, you finally hit. And, but that also comes to a level of trust. There will be people you can talk to and you bring up stuff that I've talked about with certain people and they'll look at you like crickets, like, I have no clue what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It doesn't change the truth. It just means I, I don't talk to you about those things. Mm-hmm. Not because you're not a good person. We just don't have that type of relationship. Yeah. And I think we are in the position right now I see with people that if I don't tell you everything in my life, then suddenly you're not real. And it's like, wait a second. No. I don't know you. That's like reporters that go up and put a camera in somebody's face. 26 years ago, didn't you? Or, you know, whatever. And it's like, well, hey, lady, you can ask me that question. And and this is just, I'm making this up off the top of my head. Why would I talk to you about that? I don't have any clue who you are. Mm -hmm. And just because you walk up and ask me a question, you think that I have to just get into every bit of my life? I don't know you like that. Now, if you want to build that relationship up and get to know me, you'll understand why I'm the way I am. You know what's crazy about that, though, is the hypocritical superficiality of that. Like, people don't really care what decision you made. 
They don't care one bit. The reporters sticking the, the microphone and all these people with the outrage culture and, you know, the outrage mob and the cancel culture, all that. They don't care. It's all performative. Yeah. Like they if that really camera wasn't care. there, would you be asking that question? They these people are living with the with the external morality of like a seventeenth century Puritan prude, while also demanding rights to live like a a, a Weimar like heathen. You know, like they it's pretty good. They uh they don't care about the sins. They just want the performative. Oh, I'm so sorry. We just get moral when it just becomes say about sorry. other people. Just, I'm sorry. I was talking. Say that again. No, we just get moral when it comes about other people. It, right, 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 right. Yeah. And just, you know, just pretend like you're, like you're sorry. Just go through the motions. Like there's somebody issuing an apology every other day. We, we are ruled by cowards. Our, into, our entire thing, Revelation talks about cowards are going to have their part in the lake of fire. And God, we, we've got so many cowards in our culture today that won't, they don't want to lose their position. They don't want to lose their pay. And they are afraid to say, no, I'm not playing that game. Now there's a few, I really love the few that refuse to play that game and say, no, I'm not going to apologize for that. I have nothing to apologize for. Didn't, uh, didn't, what was that comedian? Um, um, the sh- short guy, um, Kevin Hart. Didn't he do that? And he got kicked off a show, wasn't asked to host the Oscars because he's like, no, I'm not apologizing for that. Yeah, I, I remember something happening, but I don't know the details of that one. I, I don't, don't know the full, maybe I shouldn't out. have brought that up because I don't know, the, but I know it was something about that. I, I remember he got kicked off, but I don't remember if he ever bowed down and kissed the ring. I, I don't think he did. I mean, they didn't let him host. So, I, But Drew Brees, he comes to mind. Didn't he do the same thing? Like he was going to stand his ground about the kneeling thing, but he got so much flack that he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And that's almost everybody. 95% of any of these cases in the media now, in in pop culture, like even the ones who start out taking a stand, at at some point, the realities of, oh my God, I'm going to lose my sponsorship. It comes down to money. It's cowardice. Some people may not like this analogy, but look at Colin Kaepernick. He's never backed down on what he's believed in. Right. Ever. (laughs) And it's cost him his career, and that's on him. But he has never backed down. I don't want this that, to, and he can't play. Yeah, yeah, and and I don't want this to sound. No, I want it to sound the way it is. It's easy for him to take that stance. When if he has smart business practices, he never has to work another day in his life. Mm-hmm. It's easy to take that stance. What about the people that constantly bow and bend that don't have that luxury? Right. It's like I will bow, or mortgage is gone. Right. Kids are hungry. We're out on the street. So. Yes, you want to have people that it's great they're standing up and, and maybe they're <coughs> – and I'm not siding with his thoughts, but what I'm saying is it's easy to look to those people and be like, well, they can do it for me because I can't. And that, I think that's just a sign of the times we live in to where we can't be truthful anymore. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I've heard for years now, like on the – there, and you would know much better than I would. You're you're much more involved or have been in in these, in this vibe in this camp, like the the prepper survivalist, like the maybe even ex military. Not all, obviously. I don't want to generalize or over generalize, but like there's a there's a contingent out there that talks about you know they have hope of there being. Well, they're finally going to push too far. They're going to cross the line, and we're all going to rise up and, and say no. And I just don't see that happening. Because if we can't even stand up when all we have to lose is perhaps a job, if we can't even stand up and say, no, a man is a man, a woman is a woman, and you're not going into that locker room with my daughter. If if gen- I, I know there are individuals. I'm, I'm way oversimplifying. I'm way over generalizing. But the vast majority of people are just being l- dragged down this road because it's the path of least resistance. There, are, There's plenty of people who are vocal about it, to be sure. But the vast majority are complacent. The vast majority of our culture, I mean, and, and men specifically, they've become so complacent they're not going to speak out for fear of losing their job or being branded the, the R word or the 
whatever phobic word, you know, whatever accusation that has been used as a cudgel to, to make us comply for the past few generations. Uh, but if we can't even stand up when we don't have physical uh, uh, ramifications, if, if we're not going to pay our price with blood or our lives, if all that we have to lose is our money or position, and we can't even take a stand and speak truth, then there's there's not going to be a grand uprising to once the final line. I mean, the the, the boiling frog thing, it, it's overused, and some people say that doesn't even exist, the, the frog would join. But we've all heard it. But, you know, that that is true to some extent. We may have already crossed that threshold. I'm just worried that if we can't speak truth, then we're definitely not going to act on it. I guess is the way to sum up everything I'm saying. And what we, what you know, and and not to go down a rabbit trail, but sometimes we can't be given truth. Mm. The the information we we have received is so diluted and watered down, and is a different version. And I think there are some news outlets with the same story, but with different outcomes and spins on them just depending on which way you lean politically and that's a da- that's a dangerous place to be in mm-hmm. when we get to a position that we will stand for what we believe in but I, I think you're right at, at what point do do you take a stand well, I mean look at the disciples and I've and I've, I've used this before Jesus said hey I got to go back we got to go back to the city and they said Lord if you go to the city they're going to kill you and what did the disciples say well, I guess we're going to die with you. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm going to go, uh, even though we're probably going to be killed. Is that blind faith or is that real faith? Yeah, I mean, faith isn't faith until it's put to action. There's always a verb that follows anything, like Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, you know, all that. Every name that's listed, there's a verb after their name, by faith, Abraham went by faith. Noah built faith. Isn't faith until it's put into action. It's not some like mysterious thought that it's not some mysterious life force or anything. It's, it's action. Faith is putting action to your stated belief. Don't tell me you believe in God, but you live a life like a complete heathen. Yeah. You know, I mean, your actions tell what you believe. And it's scary when you get into a position in your life that you allow your knowing to be diluted. And what I mean is we are very good as believers at using the scripture for our intent. Mm. Oh yeah. Instead of it being truth, it's like, well, you know, the good Lord lenient when it comes to, you know, we can, we can talk hard about some things, but we're, we're lenient in other areas. And I I think that comes back to a factor of balance Mm -hmm. is you said it well earlier. I don't remember if you said it while we were talking or just in between. Uh, people don't know we've been talking for hours. We have fixed all the world's problems. Yeah. And uh, we're, we've are we come to figure out we're numero uno on that list. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying. You know, start this podcast. If people watch it, great. If they don't. But I hope, and, and there already has been people that have got a hold of me not because of me, but from hearing from other people, it's helped them I want to help people and want to get in a position that if you want to help people do something to help people and stay true to it, stay faithful to it. Don't just get an idea and say, well, that's not working out. If you genuinely want to help people and you aren't in a position to look to the left and right and see if the cameras are on you, that's how you know you are in a position to really want to start helping people. Mm-hmm. A lot of times we help to feel vindicated. Maybe it's because of some wrongdoing we've done. So we think a good deed will take care of that. Maybe it is, uh, the, uh, feeling of performance, the feeling of being noble. We all want to feel good. We all do, but we can trick ourselves a lot of times in thinking the intent that we're doing things is done with purpose and the will of, I want to help this person. Or yeah. motive matters. Motive. What if they tell you no 20 times? You still going to keep right. reaching out to them? Right. You know, and any more than that, we, we can shut off very quickly. And I think the intent of the heart is only displayed after, after 
there's been I just went uh, full blown uh, Canadian bean. Ugh. There's been an offense. I think offense really genuinely shows, and it doesn't have to be anything major, but I think we get in a round. We only hang out with the people that fit our yeses and don't step on our toes. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because it, it makes us feel validated. Makes us feel validated. It makes us feel good. It makes us, again, you know, make, I'm, I'm a broken record. To me, everything comes down to we're we're led, we're ruled by our feelings, by our emotions. Just whoever will tell me what makes me feel good, you know, that's that's who I'm going to go with. That's where our culture is, I believe. I, I don't ever want to have that ride or die mentality. I may be dealing with somebody and be like, hey, I'm going to be through your side during this. I'm not going to abandon you, but you were wrong. Right. And I think that ride or die, even if you're wrong, we're going to, you know, fight the world. No, people need to have people in their life be like, hey, you may want to take a take a back seat on this one. Like right. and and if we can't receive that from anybody, we're our own worst enemy. Right. We, we we have no relevance. We're, we're just floating through always being right. Somebody somebody, at least somebody in in your life has to have permission to say you're wrong. You know? And I think that ironically people think that I just for just personalizing it about mine, I think that there would be a lot of people at various stages of my life that would say that nobody has permission. But I think, I think the opposite is true. I've listened to too many that I've, I've listened to, I've given permission to too many to tell me I'm wrong. And it was it, therefore good. unhelpful and counterproductive. And I, I don't think it's any secret uh, to you or to anybody else that has ever heard me talk, but like your dad definitely is one of the figures in my life that has permission. But what I found is that I don't know if I can count on one hand the times in the past 10 or 11 years that I've known him that he's actually used that. And if he does, maybe it's in a, in a subtle way, but he, somebody that has that permission won't abuse it is the point I'm trying to make. There you go. Cause it, it can be abused. Right. And it's not like, Oh, well, I don't, I, I don't think you should wear that. Or I don't think you should paint your, your wall that color. I don't think you should do that. I, you should, you should wear your hair different if you're going to be on that kind of stuff. Of course, you're not going to give them permission to speak into your life to, to tell you you're wrong, but the more sparing it is, uh, then the more weight it carries when they finally do cash in that, or when they finally do play that card, obviously, you know, my wife, our spouse has to have permission to tell, but a lot of spouses don't, they don't give their, their husband, their wife permission to tell them they're wrong because they view their wife, uh, their spouse as their main adversary in life, as opposed to their main, like co-partner there, you know, there's way too many marriages that are adversarial in nature. Instead of we're life partners, we're business partners, we're covenant partners. We're in this thing together. We are one flesh. And so they don't even give the person that knows them the best that's closest to them, they don't give them permission to say, bro, you're wrong. And Kristen will tell me, I have to make a point because, you know, I have to make a point to say, Kristen, tell me, tell me what I'm missing. But like in, in all my calculations, cause I'm a verbal processor, I'll, I'll talk and I'll, <laughs> she's, she's very good about that. She's the listener. I'm the talker, but I'll verbal process out loud. And I'm like, I'll try to lay out all the facts as I see them and I'll, the scenario. And I'm not talking about just problems with me and her, although I do that with her in that scenario too, but like just anything in life. Okay. Here's, here's the, here's the facts as I see them, as I understand them, here's my conclusions. So am I right? Am I wrong? What am I missing? Am I missing a key fact? Am I, am I distorting a, a key element of it? But I mean, I guess that's just a long winded way of saying, yes, we have to have somebody more than one. Ideally, we have to have somebody in our life that has permission to tell us, bro, you're wrong. You're doing it wrong. You, you missed it. I understand your intention, but you're wrong. Yeah. And I think that is, that is where relationship comes in because I've always had that analogy. We will never take, uh, instruction from somebody that we wouldn't take criticism from. Right. Right. So right. if I will come and ask for advice, then that means I will receive criticism for you. That being said, there's been a lot of times somebody hasn't asked me. I just interject my thought and my opinion 
And then I'm like, wow, don't I look like a jack donkey. Bro, I'm so guilty of that. So many times. I look like a fool. I've worked so hard on it, but unfortunately, I don't think I've arrived yet. I I work so hard 